CPI plus 3.7% annual increase from April 2023. Saving over 18 months versus BT, Sky and EE's equivalent packages on 15th June 22. Subject to local availability. I'm not sure whether to start this podcast with a chant of three letters, a bit of uh, Bruce Springsteen or uh, some other American stereotype that you wish to insert here. But I get the sense that we're going to be talking a lot about the US of A in this week's Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm Connor Southall, joined by Paddy Davitt to dissect uh, Norwich City's Friday night victory over Millwall. We'll also um, reflect on what was a, a relatively big week for Norwich at Carroll Road. They got six points maximum. Uh, the, the, they could have got out of those two games. It does feel like their championship campaign is well and truly up and running at long last. Um, and we're going to get into all of that now. Um, of course, this podcast is brought to you in association with Future Radio. You can listen to the show on Tuesday evenings uh, via their uh, via their station on your on your radio, I suppose, if you uh, if you prefer to consume the show that way. Um, Paddy, we, we, we spoke and we ended last week's podcast by kind of talking about what a successful week would look like for Norwich City. I think you said four points. They took six. That's about as good as it well, is as good as it could have got, really, isn't it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I said four would be the minimum they, they needed to aim for, but I wouldn't have I wouldn't have necessarily bookmarked that as a success, but fair play. Um, that's what it turned out to be. And and particularly the, the Millwall game, I thought the manner of that, you know, Huddersfield, looking back now, obviously, um, got a little bit tense towards the end when they were 2-0 up against 10 men for effectively 40-odd minutes, you know, to concede the, the sloppy goal they did. Um, and then off the back of, obviously, the first three league games where they hadn't managed to get that first elusive league win that that felt a little bit bumpier but Millwall was I've seen a few people now since Friday night social media wise saying that that did feel like a bit of a watershed in terms of obviously the, the result the clean sheet as well worth no, noting that as well given one or two of those fairly calamitous individual defensive errors we'd seen in the previous three or four games but just the general sense of um and again, this is something that's been thrown at Smith and his coaches since they walked through the door. You know, what is a Dean Smith Norwich side? What 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 they're trying to do in possession primarily at the top end of the pitch? Um, what's the structure, you know, and what are the demands placed on the players? I thought we saw more evidence of that again. You know, ultimately, a, a coach you trust, Kieran Dowell, told Campbell, yes, I know he didn't start the other night, but he has to has done hitherto, and Dan El Sanani is a coach who really wants his teams to play with the ball and be very good with the ball. Throw Marcelino Nunes into that equation as well now. Um, but that process takes time and, you know, it was coming too slowly maybe in those first three championship games, but certainly the two games at Carr Road, um, even allowing for the manner of the Huddersfield frayed around the edges a little bit, I think that has marked a step forward and you can see exactly what a Dean Smith team is trying to achieve, what he wants them to do, be on the front foot, create chances, create big chances, but take them crucially. And obviously we'll get into, as you say, Josh Sargent's role in, in what unfolded in these last two home games. But overall, and worth reiterating for me as well, Millwall, if I was to, if you look down a list of championship sides and press to pick out an archetypal championship side in terms of the challenges you face at this level and maybe not the most individually gifted of players, but the collective, I'd probably go either them or Luton maybe uh, after their success last season. But Millwall very much are a good benchmark for what you need to have in your locker to, to succeed in the championship because they're normally there or thereabouts on the periphery of the playoffs. Um, and, and I thought for the most part, Norwich really controlled what they could have offered in terms of their threat and that physicality and threat from set pieces. We didn't see too much of that. And then with the ball, because they didn't have it all their own way, first half, they, they really had to, you know, deconstruct a few issues and, and the way they were nullified. But thereafter, it was, you know, aided no doubt by some some further words of encouragement and advice from Smith and his coaches at half-time. But the man of Norwich attacked that second half, the intensity, the moving through the gears feeling. And then you look at it and you think, well, this is only the start, really. You know, you've got Hayden to come in, you've got Zara to come in, Puki to come in, Cantwell to come in. Um, you have to start licking your lips and thinking, you know, now 
that there there is a feeling that you know it, it it's hard not to sort of put forward a scenario that Norwich will be firmly in the mix. Of course, thereafter other things will have to fall into place. They'll need luck at the right times with injuries and so on. But um, but you can now start to see the building blocks are firmly in place, whereas there was still to a degree, a bit of a leap of faith around Dean Smith and what, what he could bring to this Norwich collective, I think, on the back of, quite rightly, you know, three very patchy results, certainly, in performances against Cardiff and then against Wigan and then Hull. Um, we're not saying that now after these last two games, but it is only two games, as Dean Smith said. I think that leaves 41 now. It's a marathon, not a sprint, as the old cliche goes. And, you know, they will have to continue in this vein and get better from here because... As much as Norwich are finding their way, there's many other teams who are jockeying for positions at this stage, and it's probably not still worth making too many hard or fast conclusions about how this plays out. But I think what we did say on this podcast last Sunday is these two home games coming up, Huddersfield and Millwall, they wouldn't define Norwich and what they could achieve this season, but they would go a long way to framing what the mood mood is around the place and what the, the feeling is with the fan base. And and if that was the case, then very much now it's positivity, optimism, and looking forward. Yeah, absolutely. It was um, it, it was a really good week. I mean, if we if we start with a reflection on on Huddersfield first and foremost, because that was almost kind of what we'd seen from performances that had gone before in terms of Norwich City having a really positive start. The only difference was they probably made the most of it by scoring two goals and and two very. Um, well worked goals as well. A Josh Sargent header, of course, has kick started his kind of flurry that we'll we'll delve into in a little bit more detail later on. But also Danel Sanani, who's been who's been very influential in these two games, also was very good in the cup game against Birmingham as well, seems to have joined the party now in terms of goals and assists. But that game more generally, Pat, kind of um it, it felt like it was kind of the the shift that everyone needed. We spoke about um in in the pod last week about maybe what a win could potentially do, not just for the fans and the people around it and Dean Smith, but also in terms of confidence and maybe just getting that winning feeling back. It's something that, that obviously is spoken about a lot after relegation, trying to trying to turn the page and shift things a little bit. It only feels like you can really do that once you get your first win on the board, certainly league win anyway. And um, it, it felt like a massive step in the right direction and probably from Dean Smith's perspective, backed up a lot of what he said in, the, in recent weeks that perhaps the performances have been there. It was just about getting the the score lines and the results to align with them a little bit. Absolutely. Um, and that ultimately is is what he'll be judged on, is results. It isn't, you know, what he says in the media or, you know, the level of performance even. I mean, but he he is, and he reiterated again on Friday night, He, he the two are interlinked intrinsically for him, that you get the performance levels more often than not, he feels at this level, Norwich will, off, off the back of that, get the wins and the results. So, you know, ultimately with Dean Smith, I've written about this earlier today, actually, that, um, you know, you, you go back to that post hull kind of feeling of frustration inside maybe, and, and certainly outside the camp, and he's talking, to paraphrase him again, you know, we've lost two of the three games, but I think we're defending better. I think that was the that was the soundbite. And, of course, that had a predictably uh, negative response am among large portions of the, the social media community in terms of Norwich City fan base. Um but he felt that and and he, he felt they, they were not too far away. Unfortunately, you know, he was, you know, he's talking there off the back of not only a poor start to this season, but then we can't park it. He he was quick to shut down. There's no hangover from the Premier League relegation. But I think for a fan base who, under this head coach, saw 20-odd games or whatever it was in the top flight, then three more in the championship and, and not seeing the signs of progress they were hoping for, there was very clearly a sort of a hangover or an overhang. And... um you know, what we now have is irrefutable evidence, albeit only two games, both at home, um, but evidence nonetheless that, yeah, the things that he was talking about in the first part of the, the season are are there for everyone to see now. And um, and it will only be the evidence of what, what we in the media, what fans more importantly see on that pitch Saturday, Tuesday. You know, if if they continue in this vein, then then very much it will be the case that, you know, people will will row in behind Dean Smith because there's probably still a, a good few who are, the jury is out. You know, there is, they want more compelling evidence that, yep, yeah, okay, this direction of travel, we can see what it's about now. We can see under this very experienced head coach who knows what it takes to get a team out of this division that, you know, that there is certainly 
uh, enough confidence behind him and this group of players that you know ultimately they can achieve what the the, the main objective is, which is a third straight promotion and, and back to the Premier League. And, and if they do that, then we can worry about the Premier League, as he's said a few times since they got relegated. Worry about the what if and, and changing that narrative when they get there. The prime primary objective now is to to get there and um it won't be easy that's for sure um but then it never is in the championship and and, and I just think it's now the consistency of, of results not so much performances but again if he gets that then you would think the other follows but if they can now we'll skip over Bournemouth and, and this coming Tuesday's cup tie because I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll shuffle his resource but their next championship game is what looks a very difficult assignment uh a guy we all know very well in these parts, Alex Neal's Sunderland. I think they won at Swan, uh, sorry Stoke at the weekend, just gone, um, newly promoted. So they, they have got that momentum and go forward from from what they did it, it, coming through the League One playoffs. Um, and he knows what it's all about in the Championship as well, as Norwich know, but also Preston. He got them in and around the playoffs before it the dial turned and, and maybe he was there a bit too, too long, really, in, in the final analysis. But much like Millwall was a very tricky assignment, which Norwich managed to find a way. They will, will be presented with a similar challenge. And of course, the difference being, you know, they'll be a pretty close to a full house, I think, because I did see reports there that, as we know, their fan base is um, very large and, and they, they clearly feel, again, talking about connections or reconnections with clubs, they've had difficult times to endure that fan base, but they obviously feel Neil is building something there. So that will be a, a very intimidating atmosphere. This this time, well, next Saturday morning, isn't it? Lunchtime kickoff. So, yeah, let's you know if if the next pod we record after this one is post Sunderland and we're talking uh, about a continuation of a theme from the two home games, then yeah, I think even even more people will start to be convinced that Dean Smith is the man to uh, to take Norwich to where we all hope they're going to be, and that's back in the Premier League. But um, it needed to happen. It definitely needs to happen, and and the fact that it happened at Carr Road as well. Where you've got twenty two odd thousand home fans, they they're not daft. They they've seen it not sufficiently optimistic under Dean Smith thus far, albeit the hand he was dealt. You know, most coaches I think would have struggled to keep that team or that squad in the in the Premier League, but but still, you know, he accepted the challenge and wasn't able to turn it around in the in the short term, but. You know, maybe it just underlines again and you don't get it. You know, whatever the longevity of a championship head coach is, it's probably it's probably no more than about nine to 12, 18 months now. So you don't get time, but maybe you just needed time. Maybe it just needed a bit of time um, to, to really, as he said, pre-season was going to allow him to embed his philosophies into that group of players, work on things, because you can see from the early part of the season, it's relentless what chances he got to do anything in between games at Colney other than rest and recover players. So that body of work had to happen in pre-season. The evidence after, albeit five league games, seven points on the board, seventh in the table, I think, after the this weekend's round of fixtures, um, is that, you know, those, those core guiding principles are now in this group of players and it should only kick on from here because, you know, ultimately, there's so many games left You've got the likes of Zara not really been integrated yet, nor Isaac Hayden. Nunes is only going to get better. So, you know, while not wishing to get carried away, it it, it feels like, yep, they're now in a good space and there's enough experience in that group um, and talent to really have a good crack at, uh, you know, coming back again for the third time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought Millwall was was probably the toughest test that Norwich have had so far in terms of of opposition. They arrived. They were very structured. They played uh, essentially what was a back five and two defensive midfielders. I think Gary Rowett has probably been a little bit frustrated with how many goals they've they've conceded of late. Um, but they came on into this game off the back of a wonderful comeback away at Swansea, where two own goals um, got them back into the contest. It it felt to me like Norwich um, had to work them out a little bit, and it took a little bit of time to do that, but. When they did, they, um, they they scored two very good goals. And I suppose that leads us naturally, Pad, to, to Josh Sargent. What a week he's had. Uh, he's gone from probably people wondering whether he should be in the, the match day squad ahead of Jordan Hugill, as was the conversation at, at Hull amongst some Norwich City fans, to 
then being handed an opportunity in Timu Puki's absence. And it's very rare that Timu Puki misses any length of time um, with, with any degree of injury. We've not seen it much over the last five years or so. He doesn't give up much in terms of opportunities to his colleagues to, to, to play in his position. That One of those rare opportunities did arrive. Josh Sargent was handed that opportunity. Three goals in basically as, uh, as many days. Um, obviously, two against, uh, two against Mill, one against Huddersfield. The goals were one thing. The finishes were, were also um, one thing. His overall performance w- was another. I mean, the way he he pressed, for example, Biakowski in the Millwall game to to um, force him to to kick the ball against his own leg and and, and then nearly scored. It was the the work in the build up to his second goal against Mill, where he single handedly held off two defenders. The performances of of Josh Sargent are almost as pleasing as the as the goals, aren't they? Because he's been a player who's had to endure quite a bit of criticism. Some of it from from us, some of it justified. Um, he's played not in his natural position. It's a perfect case for a player being handed an opportunity and looking so desperate and so hungry to take it. And he's he's done that with quite some aplomb. He very much has, yeah. And it's a credit to him, really. Um, it, it must come down to confidence. It's that intangible because um, the manner of his finishes on Friday night, particularly the second one, you know, I've seen him in that position before where he's got too much time on his hands. He's got a keeper advancing and, you know, he's not very clear and clinical. But this time around, didn't even take a touch, which was a testament to the ball that Dowell reversed into his path. Um, but super confident and uh, it was never in doubt. Opened his body up, side foot, he passed Bialkowski into the bottom corner. Th- third goal in, in two two games, given, you know, the relative paucity of goals up to that point in his Norwich career. And, I thought he was telling, you know, might have been post haul now that they do tend to merge into one. But when Smith basically launched a, a robust defence of him publicly, when he talked about, you know, how valued he was within his peers, within the dressing room, uh, he didn't need to prove anything to Dean Smith. And crucially, said the goals would come. He had absolutely no doubt. Now, whether whether that was public messaging and 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 he kept, keep maybe kept his innermost thoughts on Josh Sargent to himself, but it just strikes me. For a guy who who maybe did need a bit of a confidence booster, to hear your, your head coach talking so publicly and so supportively, of course, then at that point he hadn't had the opportunity to afford it to him by this injury to Timu, but you know that that would have given him a massive boost. And I think you were at the the, the pre match for Millwall the other day, and then Dean Smith also talk in terms of it, he's the type of player in terms of man managing sergeant that he. He wants that communication channel. He wants to be, you know, have that dialogue and, and maybe be left in no doubt. And maybe that's a product of coming through from his background, from from sort of US sports and, you know, very heavily, you know, type of player who, who wants to understand his game, wants to understand where he can get better, needs that feedback from the people who matter. And, you know, that comes down to, you know, Dean Smith and... and understanding which players need that approach and maybe others respond a bit better to maybe more, you know, the stick rather than the carrot, as it were, to use that sort of phrase. But there's no doubt about it. He he looks a different player completely in terms of a goal threat, primarily. I mean, we, we, we saw the athleticism and the, the work rate and the prodigious work rate when he's been operating in that wider right-hand side. Um, but what he's added in these last two games is just, you know, being in opportunities being sorry in, in areas of the pitch to get goal scoring opportunities, but taking them and you know it, it seems a bit of a throwaway line to say maybe that just does not come down to confidence, but but it, it, you can't underestimate it because now ultimately Timu Pugi looks like he has some serious competition, and I don't think anybody would have felt looking at the options at Dean Smith's disposal that Josh Sargent would be the one. I think me personally probably thought Adam Eder off the back of what he did before injury intervened in the Premier League fertile period on Smith when they beat Everton and, and won at Watford, the game obviously where Sargent scored his two goals um, at Premier League level. But no, it's, um, you know, it's Josh Sargent who's pushed himself firmly forward and uh, that's a really interesting dynamic now. Dean Smith said after the game on Friday night, you know, now he's got now he's got to go away and work out with his coaches how you can accommodate Pookie and Sargent and, and, and both give them the platform to you know, be able to score goals in in the quantities you feel they're capable of doing now in the championship. That's a bit of a conundrum because, you know, if that if that 
it feels now it would be a retrograde step to take Josh Sargent out of that central pivoted position at the top end of the pitch and then shift him again to the, to the wide area. So that there's an intriguing element there to that. But how do you do that? Um, but that's for Dean Smith. That's what he gets paid for him and his coaches to, you know, unpick. Um, fundamentally, he wants tough decisions, top to bottom end of the pitch. And he's certainly got that now at the top end of the pitch. And that can only drive Norwich's collective performance forward. But, yeah, it's really great to see. And again, you know, as maligned as that piece of recruitment was, you know, it may in time prove out to be quite astute. It just wasn't a Premier League ready fit at the time. I think I think that's that's, that's unquestionable, really. But but if he continues in this vein, then nine ten million pound package initially to to Verder Bremen might look pretty cheap if uh, you know he scores fifteen to twenty goals and and that is a key pillar in getting Norwich back to the Premier League. So. You know, it's a credit to him, first and foremost, because it might have been easier. And certain characters may have felt, it's too tough, I can't turn the situation around, get me out of here, I'll, I'll try my look elsewhere. But never any hint of that. He, he clearly, the character of the, of the guy uh, is matched by his, you know, his appetite to, to get better, to improve, to, to, to work hard. And, and ultimately, all that was missing, I, I guess, was the goals. Big, big thing to miss if you're a striker, but ultimately that was the that was the 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 missing element, particularly for a player who's going to be judged in goals, as Dean Smith did acknowledge when he supported him earlier this season. So now he's added that he needs to kick on. It needs to be the start. It can't be what it was in the Premier League and that Watford uh, goal fest for him, which was a glorious interlude, but sadly more of the same. Of course, you spoke to him. I think after the Huddersfield game, it was very clear that. He doesn't feel he's been given an opportunity, sustained opportunity in his preferred position. So he could always fall back on that, that what do you expect? But now he's got that opportunity. My, my Lord, he's taken it. And uh, yeah, I can't wait. As I say, I'm not going to place too much store by the Bournemouth team selection, but I can't wait for the team news to drop, uh, subject to no injury issues between now and then at Sunderland on Saturday morning. And we'll see how he's how he's accommodated Pookie and Sargent because... Uh, I'm not quite sure how that works at the minute, but um, but great problem to have. And, uh, you know, if that, and also we've not talked about it in this segment, but if that then drives on Timu Puki, who hasn't really hit his straps yet so far this season, there was all of that in the summer about, you know, he'd ideally like to stay in the Premier League and have an opportunity there. Well, we're closing in on two weeks left of the transfer window. There's nothing to suggest that situation will change. So if the window comes and goes, Timu Puki's still in the building, then, let, let let battle commence. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's, it's going to be really interesting. Obviously, we've got the cup game against Bournemouth on Tuesday night. I think we'd expect Timo Puki to play in that. If he then goes and produces a performance of his own, then Dean Smith really does have a decision to make um, as we head to the, the Stadium of Light next weekend. But uh, as Paddy says, that is why he gets paid the money he does to make the decisions that he does. And, and I kind of put it to him uh, before the Millwall game at the press conference how uh, I think Josh Sargent um, hadn't played it or maybe play, I think he played it as a lone striker against Charlton in the Cup. But beyond that, hadn't played as a striker at all under Dean Smith, hadn't played in a two or or a one. Um, so this has probably been uh, an interesting week for, for Dean Smith to really assess Josh Sargent as a as a lone striker. He obviously played there in pre-season a little bit. Uh, he started there against Marseille from memory. Um, but, I mean, the, the two finishes, But if we look at the Millwall game, Pad, in terms of the first one, which is a nice bit of combination with Danel Sonani, comes from Kieran Dow, kind of breaking the lines with a, a really good run. Um, it was almost Timu Puki-esque, really, in terms of the run and getting onto the ball, and the finish was so emphatic. The second one, as we spoke about before, comes from, well, it's just rewards, really, from his own hard work, because it's a, a, a relatively... Um, well, it's, it's a it's a clearance from Andrew Omarabadeli. It bounces. He he holds off. I think it's it's Malone and um, Murray. I want to say the the two Mill defenders. Uh, Gary Mara. Mara. There you go. Mara. Mara. There we go. Um, Gary Rout felt it was a foul. I must say I didn't see that particularly myself. Um, Kieran Dowling gets beyond the ball. Josh Sargent is is then absolutely bursting to get into the box. Lovely ball from Dow, uh, and the finish is just um, well probably suggest a player who is who is flowing with confidence at this moment in time. Um and then obviously on, on Tuesday night it was a header, a flicked header from from a Sonani cross. So all different types of goals, all emphatic finishes, but the two um on Friday night pad were, were kind of, of of his own making to an extent. The first one as I said was was a one two essentially with Sonani on the edge. 
Um, and the second one came from from him just keeping the ball alive and getting Norwich City on the counter attack. So he's a different type of striker. But you you look at his kind of physical frame, I suppose, and profile. He is a player who should be powerful, who should be a nightmare for for defenders to cope with at this level. It was just about adding the goals, wasn't it? And I mean, it's not the first time. And again, it's it's important we don't get carried away off the back of two goals. But Norwich have had an example. We've got a columnist, for example, who's struggled in his first season as a Norwich City striker in Ewan Roberts and then went to, to, to score goals fairly regularly. So it's it's not beyond the realms that this, what we're seeing now, is Josh Sargent really burst into life. But it's too early to make that assessment, isn't it? But Dean Smith will take encouragement from what he has seen and the type of finishes, which are kind of vintage striker finishes that maybe haven't been in his game so far. Well, they haven't, no, really. I mean, ultimately, I'll go back to, you know, I mean, funny enough, it's pertinent because it's Bournemouth again in the League Cup, but it was last season that him and, and uh, Jollis, they, they enjoyed themselves against the Cherries at this stage of that season. But other than that, you know, it was kind of a tale of woke culminating in that glaring Brighton mess, if you recall, in front of the Barkley in that Premier League game when he just had to roll it in. To, to contrast with a player who's now full of confidence, you know, if he'd have had that opportunity uh, in the last couple of games, I think we know uh, he's celebrating again with his trademark uh, salute. So I think it is worth just a note of caution that, you know, this is very much a step down from Premier League opposition and Premier League defenders, um, irrespective of, quite rightly, not being played down the middle too often, if ever, at Premier League level, certainly not from the start of game. So, you know, we have to bear that in mind in terms of where he goes from now. But, you know, ultimately, he does look at this level against championship defenders and defences, a real, real handful. And, um, you know, his athleticism is and his size. You know, you saw you saw how well he climbed above his marker for that Huddersfield goal to, to just divert Sinani's in-swinging cross. You know, a real, real number nines type of goal. And... I thought it was an interesting point Dean Smith did make in terms of you contrast the, the, the games of uh, Team Pukin and Josh Sargent. Yes, there's differences, but there's also a lot of you know similarities in terms of those balls being fed down channels. We saw you know the red card incident in the Huddersfield game that Dan Elsonani plays that ball through. That's the type of ball Team Pukin would relish. There was one or two other opportunities um, in that Huddersfield game that that, that kind of. Aaron's cutting in or Dowell and Sonani cutting in and they're just looking to slide angled balls, short passes down the sides of defenders and for, for Sergeant in his game, but that could easily have been, you know, a pookie running on to. So I, I don't think it's it's a, a plan A and a plan B and, and there's quite there's quite a divergence between the two, but 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 there are differences and that will be very useful in certain certain types of game in the championship, I think, if Hypothetically, you know, it wasn't working with Timu Puki in, in a forward thinking role. You could you could either bring Josh Sargent on or redeploy him if he's already on the pitch and then just go in a slightly different fashion. And as Dean Smith has also said recently, the more intelligent forward thinking players he's got with a variety to that mix, the better, because they will face different challenges from week to week, game to game. Um, and what works against Huddersfield and, and Millwall might not necessarily work against Sunderland, for example. So um, it's just it's just a wonderful scenario now for Dean Smith because ultimately, as we all know, you know you can you can put a structure in place and and the, the work you do against the ball is one thing. But if Norwich are going to really fight this out at the top end of the table, they need to score goals and plenty of them. And they need to be creating chances and they need players who can take those chances and um again small sample though it is but after two two championship home games Josh Sargent is very much a goal threat and we've not even really mentioned him Adam Eder yet to come back into this equation as well um a player who through no fault of his own really is has, has, has sort of been put to the margins um but prior to a little bit like we've seen now with Dean Smith and the faith he's placed in Josh Sargent that was Adam Eder around January February of this year um in terms of a player who from his point of view, must have felt I've now got a coach who trusts me to start games and really put the pressure on Timu Puki. And if you've got Puki, Sergeant, and Ida um, all really vying for, for for being the main man this season, then you know 
I don't think there's another championship side who could boast that kind kind of potential firepower. Not the one I can immediately think of. Um, and that will give Norwich the edge over what is still 40 odd plus league games. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, I mean, I, I can't wait to see, as I say, that Sunderland team sheet, if Pookie's fit, if Sargent's fit, um, and the way he goes, because, you know, I'm pretty sure now Timmy Pookie maybe for the first time this season, certainly thought, you know, irrespective of this contractual situation, but as it looks now, he's here for the duration, probably felt he was going to be the main man and, um, you know, would continue in the same vein he has done at championship level. That's not necessarily a given now. And that is a huge testament to what Josh Sargent has produced in these last two 90 minutes. We live Norwich City. The build-up. The passion. The drama. The last-minute winners. The debate. That's why we've created Pink and Plus. The app that takes you beyond the headlines. With exclusive columns, blogs, podcasts and videos, we've got you covered. Subscribe today. Pink and Plus. Stay ahead of the game. Download now on the App Store and on Google Play. There is a, I I suppose there there will be somewhere a school of thought. This isn't necessarily my view. I'm just asking the question before maybe people shout at me. But there will be people who who look at Josh Sargent, look at the transfer fee that Norwich City paid for him and go, well, isn't this what he's supposed to be doing? Particularly at this level, he was signed as a, as you said earlier, Premier League option. Um, He scored two goals or three goals in, in the championship so far. That's probably the expectation, isn't it? Given... The, the fee Norwich paid, as I said, the reputation that he had when he arrived. He's a, a, an American international. And I guess the, the second part of that question is, is he merely scoring goals because of the, quali- the the lower quality in the championship or is it an improvement in his performances? Is it a combination of the two? Does it even matter, I, I guess, w- w- is, is probably the question. Uh, not, not for the moment, because to draw a parallel with what Smith uh, is saying when anybody wants to talk to him about the what if of a Premier League cycle, we're not there. So it's an irrelevance, basically, to discuss anything at this stage relevant to Norwich being back in the Premier League until they're back in the Premier League. So I guess that you could part that in terms of Sargent and Willie, if that was to come to pass over these next few months and this time next year they're back in the Premier League, Willie actually step forward um, and and score goals and look like a Premier League goal scorer then we'll find out in due course. But in the here and now, he does look like a championship goal scorer. Um, and yes, it's, it is fair to say you pay that amount of money relative for Norwich and their financial means. You do expect a goal return. But then you look at, he wasn't prolific for Werder Bremen. And um, and I'd also, you know, I would caution that this is, and I've just double-checked, 22-year-old striker. 22. I mean, he's feasibly five years from his peak. You know, you contrast him with the age of Timu Puki and, and what age he was when he arrived at Cairo Road and the experiences that he'd had in terms of his footballing journey. Um, Josh Sargent is learning on the job still. And and I know, to counter that point, you, you make there, Connor, at, at nine, ten million pounds, then you, you would expect him to, to be, uh, you know, be a bit more of the finished article. But, you know, maybe, as I say, and we've looked at this in depth in terms of that summer transfer window, wasn't really fit for purpose going back into the Premier League last summer. And maybe part of that in terms of Sargent was the the dial in terms of potential and end product, maybe on reflection, was a bit further tipped towards potential uh, than Norwich maybe themselves expected. Um, and that we're only now beginning to see um, maybe less of the potential and more of the end product and, and productivity moving forward. So, you know, it's... It's fundamentally um, what they paid for the guy. And, and you know, in the current climate, you see some of the sums. I mean, Gibbs White, did that deal go through uh, in the last few days from Wolves to, to uh, where has he gone to? Forest, yeah. Forest. Forest. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll lose track. If it's not Norwich, I'm not interested, mate, in the Premier League. <laughs> but, I mean, the sums that they're talking relevant, relevant to that deal, then 9 to 10 million for Josh Sargent is... You know, pretty small beer, as, as as ridiculous as that says. So it sounds so. 
the reality is if he if he weighs in with those 15 to 20 goals in a, a promotion winning side then that will look very good value because you would think given as i say you know time is on his side and his best years are ahead of him that he's only going to get better and and it maybe it did take as we discussed you know about players who need a season maybe to adjust you know i i know that it, it's not the same in terms of the finances but Look at Steeperman, look at Vrancic in, in recent times. They needed a, a season, albeit at championship level, to really understand what the demands were and how they needed to adapt their game maybe to, to have that real effectiveness. Um, and maybe this is the same process Josh, Josh Sargent has embarked upon. But um, yeah, in terms of will he make the grade at Premier League level, that aspect of it, then we, we can't really say definitively because... We, Certainly, on the evidence of what what we saw from him at Premier League level last season, the answer would be no. But then he would shoot back. Well, you didn't play me in my my my, my preferred position, so that is fair. That is fair comment. But you know, let's just hope we're not jinx this now because this segment has talked quite a lot about Josh Sargent is now on the up and up. I hope we're not turning round in November and he hasn't added to his goal tally because then I'd be blaming you, Connor. Uh, yeah, so will I. Um, he 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 has he likes Friday nights. I think we've we've made that perfectly clear as well. Um, it was it was Friday night when he scored the two goals against um, Watford. It was the, the the Friday night, obviously, that he scored two goals against Millwall. So if Norwich play on Friday night every uh, every week, then they'll be they'll be laughing with with, with Josh Sargent. Um, I, I did speak to him after after the win on Tuesday against Huddersfield, and I, I put a question to him, which was essentially along the lines of what's it been like to play in a position on the right-hand side where you've essentially been putting the team's interest ahead of your own sort of personal development, I suppose, was, was the, the question, maybe framed in a slightly different way. Um, and he must have paused for about 20 seconds before he answered that as he obviously mulled over various words in his head. And in many ways, that kind of answered the question. Um, it was it was relatively interesting, but he did go on to talk about the opportunity of playing in the Premier League. And like you say, I guess the difference would be if he did kick on, if he did go and reach the numbers that you've spoken about there, um, and he's still got to back this up. This is still two games. It's a very, very small sample size. As, as you said so we have to take that with an element of caution but if he could do that he would then bounce back into the Premier League providing Norwich obviously got promoted with that intangible that, that we spoke about confidence and he's clearly a player who thrives on it and if you have that um, of course there's the World Cup as well which I know he's targeting um, in Qatar and he'll, he'll want to be in, in the US squad for that so it's in his interest now to go and really kick on and, uh, and prove why in his natural position he should uh, he should go and um, he should go and make a success of it at Norwich City. His dad was also there on Friday night as well, which um, I think is quite a rarity. So so that was a nice personal element for him. And if we stay on the American theme pad, um, it, we kind of got wind that it was going to be um, the way that it panned out with with Mark Atanasio and the announcement um, that came. I think four o'clock on on the day of the game. No coincidence that that was released at that point. I would suggest in order to to get people lifted. Um, I, I think we we said before kick off it, it just needed a Josh Sargent goal or two and an Norwich City win to cap off a fine day. That's kind of what happened. Um, I mean, we we've kind of uh, as we said we we broke this story in May. It was late May, wasn't it? Um, a week after the end of the Premier League season against Spurs, we had the the picture of Atanasio and his seven strong delegation um, across from Milwaukee um, who took in that game against Tottenham Hotspur on the final day of the season. It's been a little bit quiet since then, but uh, not behind the scenes. The talks have been ongoing. They were at an advanced stage, obviously, when he, when he came across to Carrow Road. Now seemingly a deal for him to um, become a shareholder and, and, and take Michael Folger's shares, certainly initially. Um, has been agreed because Norwich City have now announced formally that they'll hold a meeting uh, of shareholders on the 12th of September. Uh, they're encouraging people to vote by proxy. And, and that is to um, uh, allow Mark Atanasio to join the board as a director. He would become their fifth. I think they've currently only got um, is, is it four on the board or five on the board. I'm not sure. I might, I'll, I'll count in second. Um, but that essentially would need, I think, Delia Smith and Michael Wynne Jones to uh, to vote through um, the motion. So it's going to happen. Mark Asanasio is going to be a director of Norwich City. It's a, a significant moment, really, in, in the club's recent history, Pad, because it's the first time that new um, kind of minority shareholding has happened since the Turners in what about 2007 um, that, that that kind of took pass. Um, we're still waiting for confirmation in terms of what that looks like but a really significant moment, as I said, for, for Norwich City and Norwich City's recent um, recent history, because it is a, a wealthy American businessman 
joining the board in probably after years and years of debate about whether Norwich City do need fresh investment. And I know everyone's very cautious to use the I word, um, but that is the question that Norwich City fans will be asking. Uh, quite rightly, because as we said, as we have said at various points, but we said it in this de- de- debate pre-match Friday, you know, this isn't the end of the story. This feels like the start of the story and quite an elongated start, but but for reasons you've mapped out there, there you know, there is a process, there's lots of stakeholders involved and it's no real surprise that, you know, it has taken this to this point seemingly before, um, you know, Mark Atanasio barring any unforeseen late twist between now and that shareholder meeting on September the 12th, I think, who will be elected to the Norwich City board. But it's the what next. Um, you know, Dean Smith was asked directly, that was his first public utterance on it after the game Friday, wanted to bat it up to upstairs to to, the, to those who are dealing with this in terms of it's one for the club's hierarchy really to talk about it in any great depth but um but felt it was an exciting development essentially wanting to paraphrase what he said and and it is uh, there's no doubt about it but it's what the story is from here on in I think rather than confirmation of what we've felt was going to be the case anyway you know what does a, a gentleman who reputedly is worth 700 million dollars um, and has been the principal owner of a massive baseball franchise in the Milwaukee Brewers. I think he's got. I think he's got a share in another sporting entity over there as well. I'm going to say. I want to say ice the hockey, book. isn't it? Yeah, it is ice hockey. So you know, we might have to actually now. Think, just thinking out loud, here, Connor, we might have just have to look at because the, there's a parallel there between the ice hockey sort of shareholding, if, if it's of the minor variety, and, and what his impact has been. With that, really, and and where uh, are, is there anything in terms of extending his reach in that organisation as well? Because that is very clearly the situation we're going to have with Norwich. That he isn't beyond the full shareholding at this stage, going to have any any direct power to change tack or, or take the club in a, a different direction. I don't think he would anyway. Clearly, you know his values. If you look at what he's what he's done, the longevity that he's been 16, 17 years, he's been with the Brewers, that that family community ethos, which you keep hearing about, um, that that aligns very much with Delia and Michael. So I, I don't see a radical departure uh, at any point, uh, but certainly not in the, in the interim. Um, but, you know, it's what it means in terms of, I think for me, it's more than mid to longer term. I, I don't think it's inevitable to think this guy's coming in, look at the money he's got, does this mean Dean Smith and Stuart Webber are going to be flush in the January transfer window? I don't see that link at all. I, I see this as a much more about a the beginning of a relationship and and a getting to know you phase for both parties. You know, he'll want to come in and look at Norwich City's inner workings from the inside, um, and likewise the ownership and, and the other directors and, and the shareholders. They'll want to see if you know what this what this means in terms of the direction of the club and. Is this an individual uh, that they can work with and they can see a path to what does feel like, you know, a bit of a, a turning of the dial, g- given, you know, given the age of, of the current owners, um, there does need to be a succession plan there. Uh, and we wait to see how this maps out and the speed, probably that's the most important element. I think we all feel probably there is, there is a, 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 the beginnings of a path that could, see ultimately Atanasio, you know, replace the the current owners as the majority shareholders. That's just looking at it from, from a distance. Um, but it's the speed of that journey and the pace it moves at uh, and, and the steps in between, you know. Um, I mean, I can see just from my own perspective that maybe in the shorter term that you, you start to hear more about the, the expertise that this guy can bring and bring others with him who have worked uh, at a top level uh, in the US sports and the transferable elements that could maybe work with Norwich in terms of the strategy. We know that there's this quest to to redevelop parts of Carra Road. Um, I think that's a project that they embarked on at the Brewers uh, Baseball Stadium. You know, you can see the crossover there. Um, very complex type of, of infrastructure projects. If, if they have got that expertise, they could tap into. But fundamentally, it if, as it feels, that this is the start of something that could lead to this guy um, taking firmer control or, or increasing his shareholding, then 
what's that with a view to? You know, I, I did see actually, I hadn't noticed up until now, but there is a, a Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There's another Wisconsin sports impresario who is the majority shareholder at Villa. I'm going to say his name is Wes Burns, I think. So you can be pretty sure that those two characters will be um, no stranger to each other. And, and I'm sure, you know, looking at how that guy's essentially now taking control at Villa, you know, we've seen evidence of what's happened at Leeds with a, a San Francisco 49ers affiliate uh, body go into Leeds in a minority capacity and now have seemingly engineered position where they are going to take control of Leeds and, and ownership of Ellen Road. You know, that's even before you get into the, you know, the American ownership at United at Liverpool and, and, and Chelsea now. I mean, it is, it is all the rage and Norwich are uh, potentially because ultimately we're getting carried away with the what ifs and scenario planning potentially that could be the beginning of a journey for Norwich. Um, but first and foremost, as it stands, it's to elect a guy to a board who will take Michael Forge's shareholding. And as a result, there's not going to be a radical overnight shift in, in what Norwich City are about. Um, the financial picture, I don't think that's going to immediately change. So, you know, we probably need to dial down the sense that it, it it's going to be an immediate change, of course, or, or uh, you know, a different way of doing things. I don't see that. I see, if anything, it'd be just a, a reaffirmation of continuity and evolution in the shorter term. But, you know, quite clearly, we've said it many a time, a guy who's worth $700 million, who's shown no discernible that I can see interest in soccer before and probably doesn't have too much of a connection to Norwich, Norfolk or the UK for that matter. What is the attraction? You know, it, it, I don't see it as... Um, I just fancy coming to watch a game or two at Carra Road and, uh, you know, maybe taking a place on the board. Um, but, you know, ultimately that's where it will be in the interim uh, from the here and the now if there's no issues and this uh, this ratification process is completed on, on um, September the 12th. Uh, what I, I love the fact that you've confused um, an Ipswich town winger, Wes Burns, with, with uh, uh, an American billionaire called Wes uh, Edens. I think it is, but that's that's uh, that's fine. We we we, I, we got I, that. I, I didn't mean, even I didn't even know Ipswich had a player called Wes Burns because I why would I be interested <laughs> in Ipswich? You're far more I, rounded. Than your I didn't know if it was in your consciousness somewhere, but um, that's 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 Wes fine. Hulan. Wes Hulan's the only footballer I know, mate. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah, I was just I was just looking as you were speaking there. So he's he's a part owner, part owner, sorry, of the Milwaukee Admirals, who are the the ice hockey team. He has been since two thousand and five, from what I can see. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic. Not not the sole sort of principal owner as he is at at, at the Brewers. So there is evidence before uh, of him perhaps in. in having a share of another team without being the sole figure, which is what the dynamic will be at, at, at Norwich City, providing it all gets ratified, of course, which, as we said, only needs Delia and Michael to do that. doesn't get to this stage if it doesn't have their approval. And um, Michael Folger was was very keen on ensuring that was the case um, when sort of the transfer of shares between him and, and Mark Atanasio um, was set to take place. So, so obviously we're at a stage where Delia and Michael are comfortable with Mark Atanasio coming onto the board. So I expect that to be um, pretty much a formality. What what are we expecting, Pad, in terms of it to look like? Because we've, we've obviously mentioned Michael Folger's shares. We've obviously mentioned where it could go. Are we expecting him to um, maybe arrive at the club with perhaps a higher percentage of, of shares than is being discussed at the moment? Are we, are we just looking at Michael Folger's shares? Because I know there have been there have been various whispers around him perhaps increasing his his shareholding already, even at this stage, and 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 looking to maybe push it above the twenty percent mark. Obviously, I think it's the thirty percent mark that he would then essentially have to go to all of the other shareholders and make an offer for their shares. Um, that's his just a, a rule, I think, unless we've we've got that wrong. But I think that was the case when I looked into it before. Um, what are we expect in the dynamic to look like first and foremost in terms of him, but then also what does it do to the dynamic of Norwich City's boardroom because. Ultimately now, and we know the conversations that are going to take place when they get to the Premier League, it is going to be a shift in terms of the way that they communicate how they operate, because it's always been about self-financing. Well, actually, people and supporters are now going to see a guy worth a reported $700 million um, on the board. It does change the dynamic of that particular conversation as well. It does. And, and as a club, the, the messaging around that will have to be very, um, very precise and, um, you know, very clear that that certainly in the interim and that's 
you know, worth reiterating, it's a transfer of shares between one individual and uh, another individual uh, or a family, the Pulger family. So that's essentially it. But, I mean, we obviously had the pictures of him sat there uh, a seat or two away with his family and, and other members of the Brewers organisation and a, another personal friend from the finance world in that Tottenham game, but two or three rows away from Delia and Michael. So I think the personal chemistry element of this is the fascinating aspect. Um, and as I said in a previous response, you know, you, you don't need to have an intimate knowledge of of him as, a, as an owner of that baseball club but the longevity and 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 the the fact that you know you I think you just go on the Brewers official website I think there's a there's a page there the mission statement or the core uh, abiding values you could be reading it down um, and thinking this this I'm on Norwich City's website you know they talk about that how intrinsic the community element is to what they do and being rooted in the community and and engaging with their fan base um, and that almost all more organic wholesome you know approach to owning a sporting enterprise, be it that side of the pond or over here. All of that chimes um, with, you know, Norwich's majority shareholders. And, uh, you know, quite clearly, they will feel that they're on the same page. But, and this is this is the crux of the matter for, for, for where we go from here, until they actually, it's ratified, it's done, Either he or a proxy acting on your behalf is sat around a board table, and that chemistry can develop. Then you know I don't think we can get we can get too far into the future of what it looks like or the speed it will move at. I think it's very much you know how relationships can develop from here and um, and and whether there is you know alignment on on the key aspects of what the strategy looks like moving forward. And, and that's going to take a lot of buy-in from, you know, not just the owners, but the other directors, Zoe Ward in her position, kind of, you know, one foot in, in the board dynamic, but also, you know, clearly, you know, a very important person uh, in terms of the, the business side of what goes on at Cara Road uh, in tandem with Stuart Weber on the football side. You know, all of those aspects, I think, probably hold the key to, to how fast and how smooth this process is Moving on, I mean, the, you quote the, the Turner example. That is pertinent. You know, that when when they came in at, at a similar kind of vibe to to purchase shares. I'm sure if we were to go back into the archives and look at the quotes around that, I, I remember press calls and them holding up scarves at Carrow Road. You know, the feeling probably then was that that would be the start of something, and as it transpired, um, it it wasn't. And um, and we we're not inside. We're not party to to what went on during that process. But clearly maybe the feeling was that they had one idea of how this would work they got inside the camp as it was and and felt that maybe that wasn't for them anymore and um and then and obviously backed away clearly retaining their shareholding but in terms of a more prominent role and a role that could grow into something else that never materialized so it's not beyond the realms that you know despite the obvious excitement that given the guy's wealth and, and background in US sports um that this relationship doesn't develop as I'm sure the most Norwich fans would hope it would do, but you know the fact that that this this process has now more or less been concluded successfully um, does suggest that you know the people who matter inside that club and who are shaping that club's direction of travel in terms of strategy are giving serious thought to the mid to longer term and and what Norwich City looks like for future generations. Which Adelia and Michael have always said they're caretakers, they're custodians, whatever label. Uh, they're not owners. They're they're essentially they deem their role to be passing on this club to whoever or whatever comes next in a healthier state than they inherited it. And Stuart Weber has trumpeted the same mantra in terms of his uh, area of expertise that that the club that they pass on is in a better health uh, 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 than the one they inherited, and uh, and that's ultimately um, what they will be judged by fundamentally. So uh, yeah, it's an exciting development. But it's way too early to, you know, to extrapolate that Norwich are now going to be, I don't know. Um, Cash rich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they can go and compete with other, if they are back in the Premier League, Premier League clubs in terms of wages and, and transfer fees. Um, 
I, I just think that doesn't that that's that doesn't chime with with the direction of travel that Delia and Michael have took the club on. And that clearly, as I say, this guy seems to have, have got the Brewers on in terms of you know far more organic and growth and incremental rather than throwing tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars at, at, uh, at improving uh, you know their sporting success. Yeah, and and what what again another interesting dynamic to it is exactly how it works because Delia and Michael have made a point of being very visible owners, very very or try and be very accountable owners. They're always at games, they're always present. You can always see them. That isn't the case um, with with a lot of football clubs and a lot of football clubs owners. And and you've got that dynamic now seemingly with someone who's going to be a few hundred miles away, who isn't going to be at every game, who isn't going to be as visible. That's that's going to be interesting to see how that pays, um, how that how that pans out. He's obviously going to um, be given a vote as well in in terms of board meetings. That's another interesting dynamic. It's a different voice from a different area, different expertise, as we spoke about. Um, whether that offers Norwich City with some fresh ideas, park the sort of financial elements to it, is going to be very interesting. I'm sure he will bring elements of what has worked for him um, as as a baseball owner into 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 football into Norwich City and it's worth even what you say there pad as as people inevitably want to look to the future and various different pathways even if there was a point where mark atanasio became the majority shareholder of norwich city football club he would still in premier league terms not rank among the wealthiest of uh, of owners i think he'd still be in, in kind of the bottom five percent or so of, uh, of that so that is again a major wake-up call of where english football is at as a as a whole that someone worth 700 million dollars still wouldn't be kind of even a mid-table premier league owner in terms of wealth so that's an interesting dynamic as well um to end the pod on, on a lighter note pad i think i've worked out why nori city's success has come it's uh it's dean smith's dress change he's, he's adopted a much more casual look on on the sideline. I mean, we, we obviously uh, are big on fashion here on the thinking.com Norwich city podcast. Um, it, it seems to have worked for me. I don't know if he's a man of superstition, but he tried it for Huddersfield, obviously got a good result and he tried the same for Friday night. So I'm expecting to see Dino looking more casual in, in, in the weeks ahead. Right. Man in black. Yeah, no, he, he was, uh, he was rocking it, which, you know, a former head coach of the parish used to like the old black ensemble to be fair. So whether, whether Daniel left a few outfits at Colney in the wardrobe in the, in the manager's office and he just stumbled on them the other day and thought I'd try these on. But I'm, I'm joking, of course. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, it has been duly noted uh, by our section of the press area. So, again, we'll skip over Bournemouth. But if he turns up on the, uh, the touchline at the Stadium of Light on Saturday lunchtime wearing the old black ensemble and they get the result, then, yeah, he... Uh, yeah. Well, you, you do whatever works for you, I guess. I mean, that's a funny, that's an interesting one. I mean, I have to put that to him on Monday morning. You know, is he a superstitious coach? I, I don't necessarily get the sense he would be, but uh, you never know. I mean, he described himself as a data geek. That was a bit of a revelation to me last season. So, you know, maybe he is one who has to put his right shoe on before he's left and uh, walk out the door at the, in, uh, at the right time and uh, get in his car and put the keys in in the same sequential order. I don't know. I don't see it, but... Uh, Hey ho! Anything that works and produces results, then uh, let's let's continue on that theme. I uh, yeah, sure. enough, we were you know last last week when we recorded, uh, we had the uh, it was Tony, wasn't it? Tony the fan yeah. uh, from from the Deerham area. We said like prior to these two home games, if they if they won both and got the six points, then you're probably the lucky talisman. So if this goes horrendously wrong this coming week, we might have to get Tony back on again because it's obviously Tony is the superstition, not Dean's dress sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just to, to finish, we have a couple of of kind of um, well notices, I suppose. Um, report in in the Scottish Sun, I believe today, which is quite a random place for it to pop up. Suggest and this is Sunday as we're recording this, I, I should specify suggesting that Manchester. Anytime you mention Manchester United, I think it's greeted with a giggle. But the Manchester United are potentially weighing up uh, Tim Krul as a, a number two option behind David De Gea. Obviously, they lost uh, Dean Henderson on loan to, to Forest um, in this transfer window. Um, 
given the, the scattergun approach of Manchester United, they'll probably sign a striker as their second goalkeeper. Um, and Tim Krull may well end up as a, as a centre forward uh, if that was to come to pass, given given the state of their recruitment. There was also a report on, on Friday, which emerged literally, uh, or I saw it literally as Dean Smith was walking out of the press conference room. So I couldn't actually put him to it. Although I think um, it was put to him after the game, wasn't it? About uh, a couple of loan bids from from two Italian clubs, Monza and, uh, and Atalanta, uh, potentially making loan bids for Max Aarons alongside Bruce Munch and Gladbach of course where Daniel Farker is at the moment um, and I think Dean Smith kind of rejected those out of hand didn't he or say he wasn't aware of those which is probably a fairly standard response I think in, the, in a head coach sporting director model you can kind of bat those questions away with a little bit more ease when, when you're not the person directly dealing into those but obviously a couple of weeks left in the transfer window so it's going to be interesting to see what unfolds um, around that? I, I suppose Max Aarons is, is probably the big one, isn't he? So we will watch that with interest, of course. Um, if you haven't taken out a free trial for the Pink and Plus, what are you doing? Come on, get get up to speed. Norwich City winning games, plenty of exclusive content over there, written video um, as well as uh, potentially some audio when, when the games calm down a bit as well. We're in a fairly relentless period. So um, we're hoping to revive the, the Monday Night Club pod special that we do on on there, for instance, um, very soon. So that's worth keeping an eye out for. As I said, pinkin.com tab in the top left that says Pink and Plus. Click on that, and uh, you can you can uh, access all of that exclusive content. And uh, as I said, no better time to do it when the games are coming thick and fast. Paddy, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. The American Dream is well and truly alive and kicking at Carroll Road for Norwich City. Let's see what the next week brings. Bournemouth in the cup, and we'll join you after. To Sunderland away. Hopefully, this week goes as well as last week did. Thank you very much for listening. See you soon.